you want to get, get a picture of Paul's knees and his squat. You guys all ready? Yeah. All right, my name is Peter Simonson. I'm the executive director for the ACLU of New Mexico. We are so delighted to welcome the governor's signing of HB 560 today, the bill that amends our civil asset forfeiture laws and restores basic property rights to New Mexicans. This was an amazing bipartisan effort that was reflected by the organizations that worked with the legislature to pass this bill. We'll um, hear from all those organizations today. Let me begin by thanking uh, a couple key people who helped make this happen. Uh, first and foremost, of course, Governor Susan Martinez for signing this historic piece of legislation. Also certainly want to thank Representative Zachary Cook, the sponsor of HB 560, um, and Representative Lisa Turaco, who was the Senate sponsor of the bill. Um, have to thank Hal Stratton, former New Mexico Attorney General, and Brad Cates, who was the director of the U.S. Justice Department's Asset Forfeiture Office from 1985 to 1989. Um, and finally, Lee McGrath, National Institute for Justice. To my right, I have um, Emily Kaltenbach, who is the Executive Director for the Drug Policy Alliance here in New Mexico, and Paul Guessing, who is the Executive Director for the Rio Grande Foundation here in New Mexico. Um, just a few comments about the, about the bill, and I'll make a few additional comments, and then I'd like to pass it over to Emily and Paul. Um, you know, in broad strokes, this bill uh, requires law enforcement to have a criminal conviction before moving to permanently forfeit property that's been seized in connection with a criminal investigation. But there are some other important elements of the bill that you, I wouldn't want to get lost in the mix. Um, for example, this bill will also require law enforcement to provide a certificate of what's been seized to the property owner so that they have a record of what, in fact, has been taken from them. Um, the bill will establish a formal procedure for owners to challenge the seizure of their property and, in fact, it will require the Department of Public Safety to annually report online um, not only in aggregate what law enforcement has seized in the state, but also to do that on an individual um, uh, agency basis. Those are all very important elements of the bill. They contribute to the transparency of the way in which our law enforcement agencies um, use their extensive seizure and forfeiture powers here in the state. We think they are um, very important. Um, let me just say that uh, there's a lot of background to this bill. We in the ACLU have been working on this issue of civil asset forfeitures for many, many years. Um, and for us, and as I think I speak for the other folks here at the table, this bill was for Stephen Skinner and his son Jonathan, whose $17,000 were seized by New Mexico law enforcement in early 2012 as they were traveling through our state on the way to a vacation that they ultimately had to abort. This bill was for Anastasio Prieto, an El Paso truck driver, who in 2000 lost his life savings of $24,000 when it was seized by New Mexico State Police after he crossed the border from Texas into southern New Mexico. This bill is for all those people in our state who, like Stephen, Jonathan, and Anastasio, lost their money and belongings in law enforcement seizures and who never even were charged with a crime, much less convicted. Stephen, Jonathan, and Anastasio had the ACLU's help to reclaim their property. Most people aren't so lucky. With her signature today, Governor Martinez has corrected a fundamental injustice in the laws of our state, and she has restored the rights of New Mexicans to their proper place. With that, let me turn it over to Emily and have her make some comments. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, Emily Kaltenbach with the Drug Policy Alliance, and very proud to be here today proud to be part of this diverse coalition of organizations that led to the signing of this law. And uh, you know, really today is a historic day for New Mexico. Few people would really know that this law now lead, makes New Mexico lead the nation in civil asset forfeiture reform. In fact, we now are going to be looked at by other states that are wishing to follow suit in reforming their, their laws. So New Mexico now is, is really the leader um, for, for this type of reform. Now, also this bill uh, is very timely in that just early this year, Senator Rand Paul introduced legislation in Congress, and this is bipartisan legislation. It's called the Fifth Amendment Integrity Restoration, or otherwise known as the FAIR Act. 
And what that would do would eliminate Department of Justice's program that enables state and local police to keep proceeds, uh, property seized from citizens. And so New Mexico now becomes a springboard for other states that want to follow suit and also gives uh, a message to Congress that it's now time to roll back these types of reforms that we see across the country that were enacted in the, in the 1980s. New Mexico also has succeeded today in reining in one of the worst excesses of the drug war. Like other drug war programs, civil asset forfeiture is disproportionately used against poor people, people of color who can't afford to hire lawyers to get their property back. So this law is an important step towards repairing some of the damage done by the drug war and the, the damage that is inflicted, inflicted upon society and our system of justice. So again, today is historic, this is significant legislation, and we're proud to say that New Mexico leads the way. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Paul Gessing, president of the Rio Grande Foundation, a free market oriented research organization here in Albuquerque, working on a wide variety of public policy issues uh, facing New Mexico. And uh, this is, first and foremost, a very unique coalition Normally, the Rio Grande Foundation is uh, considered to be on the right side, conservative, uh, and we're working with organizations and people uh, across the spectrum, and it's very gratifying to be able to do that on such an important issue. Uh, for us, it really boils down to uh, this document, the United States Constitution, uh, specifically the Fifth Amendment, which prohibits an individual from being deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Uh, that's a simple way to state that this legislation, which uh, we're very pleased that the governor has signed, uh, will restore individuals' rights over their property, and that they won't have uh, their property taken from them unless they're convicted of a crime. And that is so important uh, to equalizing uh, the freedom of average citizens relative to the people who are charged with protecting them and the police agencies and officers. Uh, I would like to uh, briefly thank, in particular, uh, Institute for Justice again. They're a national organization uh, that we've worked with uh, regularly, but on one specific piece of legislation several years ago uh, relating to eminent domain, and uh, that was the last sentence of the Fifth Amendment uh, about private property being taken uh, without just compensation. So we're working on restoring the Constitution in New Mexico one sentence at a time, and the Institute for Justice has played a significant role in that. Uh, and I would just also say that this is, uh, aside from everything, and I agree with Peter and Emily 100% in their, their uh, previous statements, but uh, there is transparency as a, a component of this something that's very important to everyone, again, on both sides of the issues. A, a website will be set up, reports will be made by a local policing agencies, and the Department of Public Safety statewide will have a one-stop shopping for a website for everybody who is interested in the issue, has items seized for whatever reason, that they can go and look at uh, what's happening, what was seized, and uh, what the reasons were. Uh, so, this is just a very comprehensive, and as Emily said, truly cutting edge, first in the nation piece of legislation. Uh, and from a uh, New Mexico perspective, it's great for us to be not 49th or 50th or 47th or whatever normal number we get at the bottom of the various uh, ratings, but for a chance uh, we can scream from the mountaintops, we're number one in a good way. So, thank you. So why don't we take some questions? Uh, Peter. A couple months ago, we in the New York Times and a couple other entities, uh, outlets, did that story about Pete Donnelly, who's the city attorney in Las Cruces. And you remember the story, I think, and we interviewed you about it. What does this say, this new, this bill signing say to people like him and his comments and this mentality that a lot of police and prosecutors have had all over this country, and certainly here in New Mexico for years, that um, civil forfeiture can basically pad their budgets during budgetary shortfalls? What, what should this say to those types of, that mindset? 
I mean, I guess I would say this restores the sensibility to the laws that surround forfeiture proceedings. Um, it is not sensible for city governments to look upon those laws as a gold mine when the gold mine derives from such a fundamental injustice in our laws. What this, what this legislation does is it creates the right balance between the powers of law enforcement and the property rights of the private citizen. And we think that, um, that, that this law will, will in no way compromise the ability of law enforcement to carry out their, to carry out their duties just as they have in the past. Um, but what it will do is it will give the, the private citizen uh, the assurance and transparency that they need to know that if in fact their property is seized in, in conjunction with a criminal investigation, that they have a fair process for ensuring that they get it back if they're never convicted or even charged with a crime. Um, let me see if any of my co-panelists have comment. Well, I would just further add to that that uh, in government, the legislature is responsible for uh, allocating budgets. Uh, we don't have agencies out there uh, kind of just raising their own funds uh, outside of the legislative process. So this is another good government transparency oriented aspect of the legislation. Do you think there's ways around it? Could, you know, police departments seize vehicles under city ordinance? Because this is a state law, I mean, is there rules to this? I would say one, check against that is the fact that all the revenues go to the general funds as opposed to their own departments. So there may be loopholes, and Peter's probably better to speak to the actual ins and outs of all the loopholes, but it also attacks the incentive. And you know, most police are great, they do a tough job on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, put their lives on the line, all those things, uh, but we're all human, and when you're trying to make your budget and get uh, incentives and bonuses and this, that, and the other thing, the, the human temptation is there and certain numbers of people are going to go along with that. But by making sure that all the proceeds go to the general fund, you're cutting that incentive uh, way down. Yeah, let me just add that, you know, this bill was, was drafted by the, the, the architect of federal laws that govern civil asset forfeiture for federal and local aid, state, state and local agencies. So um, it was carefully crafted, it was extensively uh, written, so that is to say that it makes extensive revisions in our existing statutes. Um, if there are loopholes, I think they're going to be pretty hard to find because this is a state law that supersedes the jurisdiction of local local laws. So if there are, for example, you know, the DWI, vehicle uh, forfeiture um, statutes or ordinances that you have in places like Albuquerque and, and, I, and probably most municipalities around the state, um, they will all have to abide by these, these requirements. That's my, that's my reading of the law, of, of the law. And, and let, me just, let me just add to that, that you know, one of the things that has come up and, and it comes up in the cases that I mentioned is this procedure whereby um, oftentimes local law enforcement, uh, in order to get around lo uh, local uh, restrictions on forfeitures in the past, has called in federal law enforcement to seize property, and then they have received part of that property in shares through the Equitable Sharing Program, a federal program created under federal, federal law. Um, we believe that they, these laws will in fact close that key loophole and make sure that if indeed um, law enforcement receives, or that is to say if the state receives those shares through the equitable sharing program, they will go first to the general treasury and will, will go to the general fund so that there isn't any question about a conflict of interest when law enforcement is seizing property that may actually go into its own coffers. Um, that's no longer going to be a conflict because that money will, that, those, that property will go into the, the general fund. But they will still be able to, I mean, the feds can still seize property without a conviction, correct? Uh, it, yeah, uh, correct. I mean, this, the Department of Justice program still exists, but as I mentioned, you know, I think we're going to start seeing changes at a federal level. Uh, now that this is a truly bipartisan effort, we're seeing, you know, Senator Rand Paul, Mike Lee from Utah, a whole host of Democrats in the, in the House of Representatives for introducing exactly this type of legislation that would close. Uh, those at the federal level. And, and can, can, I, can I just um, make a, 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 an additional comment there, Dennis? I mean, I'm a, I hope that this sends a signal to our federal lawmakers that it's time for there to be reform at a federal level. We 
because we still will have to deal with these laws being implemented at, in the, at the federal level the way they have in the past been am, implemented at the, at the local level. But it, it is our hope, and one of the exciting things about this legislation is it sends a message nationally that we need change at the federal level, and it's, it's our hope that this gives some more impetus to that movement. Do we know, I'm sure this has been published, so I just don't know, how much uh, police departments or law, law enforcement agencies in New Mexico is, have seized any property over the years? There, I mean, just as far as Bernalillo, the city of Albuquerque, Bernalillo, you know, we've, the Albuquerque Journal presented some of that, that data that I think showed close to 14 million over a three year period, I think three to four year period. Um, it's quite significant. Um, when, when, and, and I know that it, it happens in other jurisdictions around the state. Yeah, I think was it, it, it was something like something along that those lines uh, since 2010. Yeah, 2010. Was it 11 million? I think. Uh, I think 11. 14. 14 years. Yeah. Yeah. Nationwide, it was like 5.6 billion over some similar time. Mm -hmm. And it is tough to measure that though too, because I mean, a lot of in a lot of places there's it can go unchecked, correct? And this this will change that here in New Mexico at least. That's right. I mean, unfortunately. We Today we don't really know how much gets seized because there is no uh, reporting and accountability by any of these local jurisdictions. So that's, an, as Paul mentioned, a really important, exciting part of this piece of legislation is is creating some transparency and accountability. And uh, Peter, have you all called Mr. Skinner?